Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Honored to have you, uh, Leo Azin from Boston University. Give us this long awaited talk on the protecting circuits from leakage, uh, computationally bounded, and noisy cases. Ah. Thanks, thanks, Buzz. Yeah, my, my previous attempt to give this talk was interrupted by an injury, so I was hope nobody suffers during this one. Uh, <laughs> we all go home healthy. Um, so, this is joint work with uh, Sebastian Faust, Tal Rabin, uh, Aran Tromer, and Vinod Vaikuntanathan. Notice that Tal Rabin gets to be the fourth from the right end of the co-author list, which is quite amazing, um, <laughs> if you think about it. Uh, OK. So um, I'm sorry? There's a bias in the community towards the later end of the alphabet. Ah, I see. So maybe it's, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's not. People so. prefer to co-author papers with such people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so so I want to. I, I think actually most of the people in this audience are familiar, but I want to set. I want to do the right kind of setup. Um, and what cryptography does, uh, starting from at least 1948, and maybe you could even argue from from Kurhaus in the in the uh, in the 19th century, is thinks for all adversaries. Right? <laughs> and so we, we have this very nice for all quantifier. We say we're secure against all adversaries. But then you really have to think about what exactly do you mean by for all. Um, and so if you look at, you know, Shannon's theory, it's for adversaries who are observing the communication. So they're sitting on this wire, your adversaries, and they're looking at your communication. And that's really what for all means. Um, and then if you look at the first uh, message authentication codes by Gilbert and William Sloan, you know, it's for all adversaries who are sitting on the wire and are able to modify your message. So it's actually different for all. Right? We changed the for all already. Uh, in, in, um, and then if you look at the first... Uh, there are complexity theoretic based uh, crypto definitions, you know, Blum, Mikhail, Theorem Generator, for all polynomial time adversaries who see something and then try to predict something. Um, and actually, I'm going to focus a little bit on, on this one because it's the easiest to explain our, our setting to. If you look at digital signatures, um, they were a very nice example of adversaries that receive messages from somebody that they're attacking, right? So, so the classic definition, just to remind people, right? So there's a signer, there's an adversary. Um, the signer can get signatures on messages of its choice by asking, right? So ask nicely, get a signature. Ask nicely, get a signature. Adversary. And then, sorry, I'm sorry? Adversary. The, the adversary can, uh, I apologize. Yeah, the adversary can get, me can get signatures from the signer by asking. Right? So there's this message exchange going on. Um, so that's what for all really means. And in most sort of traditional models, the adversary interacts with something the, on a signer or the the, the prover or the verifier or something via messages. Um, and so, so we, you interact via messages, you send a message, you sit there, you receive a message back. And what the other party does is not really visible to you. And so the question is, does that really capture for all adversaries? And uh, for the past roughly decade or so, people have been realizing maybe it doesn't really capture for all adversaries nearly as nicely as you'd like. Um, because a physical computer is not a black box, so when the adversary is interacting with the signer, the signer actually has a computer, perhaps a very old-fashioned computer, uh, <laughs> uh, that, that contains a secret key, right? <laughs> a Turing machine, uh, a really old-fashioned computer, a computer that contains a secret key. And this, uh, and so, uh, and so, so physical computers can actually leak information about this secret key that's inside, and the adversary can observe this leakage. So, you know, here's pretty pictures of leakage is pretty of, of observations. Um, and some portions of some bits, that's intended to be some portions of some bits, right? Some portions of some bits will somehow go to the adversary. Um, and this is not a, a hypothetical concern. These attacks are real. They're very powerful, uh, starting probably with, uh, with timing attacks by Kotcher. They, they caught a lot of attention. Um, you can actually see how long computation takes um, and then uh, figure out some information from that. You can see how much power the computation consumes. You can listen to the computation. So the classic example is that multiplication sounds different from squaring on your typical Intel chip. You can actually hear whether your chip is multiplying or, or squaring um, and so on. So you can, you can actually get a lot of information. 
OK, so, so you want to rethink for all adversaries and actually try to, do, to capture that, right? So one way to do it is to say, OK, uh, crypto should, uh, should, should change what it means by computation. It shouldn't just say computation means I send you a message and you send me back a response. It should mean something else. Um, and of course, right, it, it's well justified computers are physical devices. The black box model of, of sort of sending messages, waiting, and receiving a response is not the right one. Um, the other approach is uh, it's not our fault. Uh, let the engineers build their computers better, right? And computers so that they don't leak. Um, and the justification is well, what can I do if your computer leaks and my secret key is in your computer? I'm stuck, right? So b give me one that doesn't leak any information. Um, and a lot of the recent work has been on trying to bridge the two, right? Sort of say, okay, well, computers will leak, but maybe they won't leak everything. Maybe we can still store a secret key in them. They just won't leak it all out. So, so the big picture model is that computers will leak something. The adversary can observe something that leaks. Uh, and the crypto schemes will design to be secure against such adversaries, as opposed to against adversaries who don't observe anything. OK, so this is, I know, a very high level. And now I'll try to sort of make the model precise, the one that we work in, and so on. But uh, that's why we're doing it. OK, so what am I going to do? Um, I'm going to talk about the model of computation. The, the, the second thing, mm -hmm. there is another variant, which I guess is some, something equivalent, is that um, in many applications, maybe the computer leaks, but the person you're trying to protect from is, doesn't have access to that. Good, right. So, so the, you know, if the person you're trying to protect from is in Australia and I'm here, then hopefully they cannot hear my computer and cannot and so on, right? So, although they can still do a timing attack probably, right? So it's not, it's not clear that even if they're in Australia, I can do something about it. Um, so, right, right. Uh, separate, be far enough away and make every computation take the same amount of time and, and so on. But, um, okay. So, all right, so I'll try to make the model and, and, and the adversary precise. And actually, that's probably the most important part of the talk. I'll talk about the model in which we work, and then the rest we'll see how far we get. Um, OK, so what's the model of computation for this stock? This is not the only way of approaching this. But, but for this stock, a model of computation is a circuit. And what do I mean by circuit? I mean, OK, so I'm drawing circuits left to right instead of the traditional way. You know, there's some inputs. They go through some gates. There's some outputs. And so it's a combinatorial circuit, but not quite. It's a stateful circuit, actually. It's not a combinatorial circuit. It's really a clocked circuit. So there's a state. It sits somewhere in there. Um, and when you run this once on some input M, on some input X, rather, you get an output Y, and you get a new state that gets, goes back inside. So it's a clocked circuit. Right? These are registers. Um, OK. Um, and so at clock cycle i, the circuit on xi and m minus 1 will output yi and mi. Right? mi goes back into the circuit, and yi is up. Okay. All right, so that's the model of computation. So what's the model of leakage given this? So um, there's a circuit, and you can train some, you know, some antennae, some oscilloscopes, whatever magical tools you have, which is very far from my area of expertise. Uh, but there are people here who know more about it. Um, you, you, you can train various devices on it and then get some data from those devices. Um, so we're thinking of the apparatus chosen to abuse the circuit as being chosen by the adversary. But the set of choices is limited. And in fact, in this talk, it will be fairly highly limited. And um, there will be strong arguments to make that perhaps we're too limiting. Right? So this talk is one attempt to do something. And then you could argue that it's not, not strong enough, but at least we'll do something with some. Um, with some amount of apparatus, right? So there's there's some we're going to limit the choices of apparatus. We have a limited class of things you can you can observe, <coughs> and there's a polynomial time adversary who is the usual sort of polynomial time adversary who then gets information from that apparatus. So there's this two-step process. It's not like the adversary abusing the circuit. The adversary has tools that can abuse the circuit, and then um, and then do something with it. Okay. So a bit more precisely, the adversary will select a function from allowable class of functions. So we'll have to actually specify the class like, for which. So for all, it will be for all adversaries that can choose things from class L. That's really what for all will mean. And that function gets applied to all the values on the wires of a circuit. Okay? And if we think 
of the wires that are sort of carrying the essential information, you know, the information from memory comes out on the wires, and all the, all the information actually comes out on the wires, then, then this captures everything. It's just a question of what the class of, what, what L is will determine how far. The circuit is sort of publicly known. Good, so actually you're asking a very good question. Give me a minute and I'll tell you exactly what we're trying to protect. I haven't yet told you really what we're trying to protect. Um, and of course for this to be meaningful, right, for this to be interesting, if F is the identity function, then the adversary just gets the values of all the wires of the circuit. The adversary has a full view. The circuit is fully transparent. So F is going to be, you know, the, identi the identity function is not in our class, just to be clear. Otherwise, we probably won't be able to do anything because the circuit is fully transparent. So it's not limiting in any way. Um, so good, so this was Sylvia's question. What are we trying to protect? We're actually trying to protect M. So we're thinking of the circuit as a publicly known circuit. The only thing that's secret is the state. M as was the state, M stands for memory. So think of the circuit as containing a secret key, you know, the secret key for AES, the secret key for a signature scheme. And we're trying to protect is that information. Because that's the only secret that's really there. The, the scheme is known. Um, so Roughly, and I will make it even more precise, but if the adversary can choose x, right, so x is the input, and the function that computes the, that, that measures the circuit in some way, and then get y, and the measurement applied to the wire values during that computation, then m is protected. Okay, and what I mean by protected, I'll make more precise. But, but the intuition is this, the secret key should not, you know, so you get, you, you get a chip and, and I'm, I'm telling you that my chip computes digital signatures, right? And you say, well, please issue me a digital signature on a message, just like in the traditional attack on digital signatures, chosen message attack. You will get that digital signature and you'll also measure something as I'm issuing that digital signature. Well, that should be, you know, you shouldn't get anything about my secret key, roughly. Uh, So, is known. I mean, so I'm, then, right? sorry, the circuit is the circuit is known, but M is not. Okay, so can I think of M as, in, as an input to the circuit? Uh, I, so I think of M as being hardwired at circuit creation time somehow. You know, the secret key was chosen and and fixed. Uh, you can think of M as random. No, X. I, I, you can X send is, a series of X's. X is chosen by the adversary. Right. right. And can I think of M as an input that I cannot choose or something? Like I that? see. So I haven't thought about that because then it's not clear who chooses it. So M, by, by your definition, M is a function of what X and M I minus one. Right? right, so there's some M zero. The circuit is. has some influence on M in the sense. Right. But the does the X circuit actually is change M? X may change M. It may not. Um, so, so for instance, if you, man, if you manage to specify the entire digital signature as a single combinatorial circuit, which you may not want to do because it will be a very, very, very big circuit, right? But if you can, then, then sure, M does not change. But in fact, you can think of, of your Intel chip computing your digital signature, in which case it's going to have intermediate states in its registers that relate to, this, to the key, right? So it actually takes multiple cycles, and M changes during those cycles, and then at the end of it all, you get back to the original key. So, so Does that make sense? So, so combinatorial circuit is, is not necessarily that one operation is all you care about. So but what am I, uh, what's, what am I designing? So you mean what is the circuit doing? No. Oh, oh. Uh, so this is a solution. This is what we're. This is a problem that we're trying to solve. Uh -huh. But what's the solution space? I mean, can hey, I change? G can give I change me, give me a minute. Okay. Give me a minute. Give me a minute. I'll, I'll tell you exactly. I, I hope to answer that question. Yeah, because in particular, if I can uh, modify M by choosing X, right? Yeah. I could uh, modify M when I, I can predict that M is a given constant at the end, and there is nothing else to protect. Mm -hmm. So we to pick up. So, so protecting M is not the right, really the right, right. option. Right. Um, okay. So. Good, let me tell you the adversary and computational leakage model, and then I will tell you what I'm trying to protect. So I'll make the adversary computation. So the circuit starts in some state, let's say M1, I guess I could have started in M0. Um, the adversary gives X1 and F1, gets back Y1 and F1 applied to the wires that were, uh, that uh, all the wires of the circuit during that computation. And then also, as a result of that, there may be a new state M2, which may or may not be equal to M1, depending on. And then the same thing happens, right? X2, get back. And, and so there's a, some repeated, some polynomial number of times that this happens. Right? And sorry, M3 came up at the wrong time. Okay, so this is the picture, right? There's MIXIFY and so on. 
the goal is to build a circuit so that the adversary gets the same information as it would get without f applied to the wires. That's really the goal now. Okay, so that's what I really mean by protecting m. I really mean you don't get anything out of the leakage. Because clearly you don't get anything out of x, you already know it. You don't get anything out of y, you already know it. The only thing you could get something out of is m. And I'm saying that whatever information you get about m, you would get without the leakage anyway. So if the circuit happens to leak out m by just equal making y equals m, I'm not going to protect you. Does that make sense? So I'm protecting. While uh, preserving some other functionality. Good, 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 good. You, you, you keep pushing me to give you the full definition. I want to give it to you slowly. But yes, while preserving functionality is the right thing. Of course, if I, you know, a null circuit is not going to be very exciting. While preserving functionality. So, but, but let's just think about it. If we can build this circuit that satisfies this property for a digital signature scheme, we'll be happy. Because then, it will remain secure even against an attack that is a side channel attack and a chosen message attack at the same time. Does that, so that's the example I gave. So if we can build such a circuit for some, you know, if, if you come to me and say I have this awesome signature scheme, and if you compute it via this circuit, then leakage will tell you nothing. That'll be really cool because then the adversary doing adaptive chosen message attack can be right next to me as long as the space of allowable leakage functions guarantees that this happens. Attacks come from this small family L. Right? Come from this family L, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. To parse it correctly, it should be if we can build such a circuit for a secure signature scheme, because otherwise. <laughs> yes, you know what happened? If I, put, if I put the word secure, Silvio, I did this. I put the word secure there, and I. Well, the whole thing didn't fit. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It will remain as secure. As secure. As actually, actually, yes. the word as will probably fit in there. So where, where security is defined under some evolutionary model of <laughs> secret key, right? Right. Uh, so, sorry, what, uh, so, so, so in this case, actually, in this case, the secret key doesn't even have to evolve. That's the nice thing. Okay. The, so it might be intermediate state that changes, but at the end. Uh, but you're keeping a secret key. I mean, the, here so, so M so could M, be more. It could so be a state. It's always secret. the same secret key. Okay. MI here is always the same secret Okay, good. In this example, okay. it's okay, good. the same okay. secret Fine. Or you could imagine that my secret key changes, and, and that's what makes the thing secure. In fact, there are many, many constructions these days that do exactly that. Right. Um, well, the public key remains the same. The secret key changes. That, that's an approach that a lot of. Uh, so then X is just the message, and Y is the signature, right? And uh, and M is the secret key, which is sort of con confusing in terms of notation. Um, and the same thing. Oh, I should put the word as there. The same thing. Let's say it's a it's an encryption scheme that's secure against chosen ciphertext attack or chosen plain text attack. If it's a symmetric encryption scheme. Again, the adversary in the traditional for all adversaries definition is allowed to interact via messages, right? It's allowed to say, please decrypt this, get a decryption. Please de now it says, please decrypt this, and while you're decrypting this, I'll watch you using my, my apparatus that belongs to class L. And I will do this repeatedly, and it will still remain as secure, even against side channel attacks. Um, OK. So that's a noble goal, right? Does the goal make sense as a noble goal? Yes, I mean, I want, to, I want to convince people that we actually want to build these things. OK, so now, now a bit more formally. Um, the more formal part is I want to say, what does it mean that you, you get the same info as without the leakage? And we're going to do the usual cryptographic route. We're going to say that it's simulatable. So for every adversary who gets the leakage, there's a simulator who doesn't and yet behaves the same way. So for every adversary who does this thing that I just described, there is an attacker who doesn't get any leakage on the wires, doesn't get the F, and yet is able to produce only the same result, exactly the same results. And that means that F is not helpful. This should be false because no one is involved, Good. There may be randomness evolved because the circuits themselves are, are, are possibly randomized. I have not yet told you what allowable gates I have, right? I'm, so I, I will specify what circuits exactly I have. So they will be actually random. And the XIs and YIs on the left and the right and the MIs are supposed to be the same or? Good. So the functionality is the same. OK. Uh, and therefore, right, if the adversary queries on X0, it's going to get, and the simulator queries on the same X0, it's going to get the same result. OK. So they actually, the, queries, the query sequence has to be the same. 
Um, we do not I have to go back and do the definition exactly, but at least we do not intend to allow the simulator to query the circuit more than the adversary queries that are on different inputs. It's intended to be exactly the same. Okay, sorry, first of all, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. can I say to add to it? I'm not convinced that this is uh, doable. Okay. In the following sense, because I don't know what maybe what the class A, A, A is, but assume that this devil on the left could do one tricky thing. When he chooses XI plus one, mm -hmm. he chooses FI of the previous wires. And the, the mirror uh, on the other side, he cannot do that. So what do you mean by what do you mean by phi of the previous one? Because so I can choose x. Oh, x I, is I equal to f. I took a apparatus, I measure f. I see. I take this f that I measure, and that's my next x. Good. Yeah, and the then point. the one on the right, uh, how the hell he can do it? So unless, you know... It's probabilistic. What? Yeah. So, so it's probabilistic, so for example... So the sequence will not f, be exactly If f i of the wires will always look like a random coin... But still, it will not be exactly equal. Silvio is right. Yeah, the sequence yeah, will yeah, not yeah. be equal. So actually, it's the good. The sequence will not be equal. So it's really the number of queries. Then. But so there is. Yeah, uh, yeah, there is. So okay, uh, I have to think about this. It's been a while. Any good definition cannot be summarized uh, in half an hour, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But you're right. You're absolutely right. This is the um, definition of a good definition. <laughs> we right. The the simu right. Given that the two things are, are, are random, even even simpler. If the adversary has some randomness, randomly chooses some x. The simulator randomly chooses some x. They're not communicating. They will not choose the same x. So you cannot guarantee that the sequences will be the same, period. You can only guarantee that the number of queries will be the same. I think that's, that's a good point. Yes. Thank you. So if you want to preserve the connection between D and M, right, in both cases. That's yes. All. That, that's all. I mean, that, that's what's going on. But the history evolves differently. Okay. The, the history may evolve differently. If, if there is no history, I mean, uh, you want that the correlation between M and B is zero in both cases, or after zero. So we will not guarantee that the query sequences are the same, but we will guarantee that the output um, on the left and the output on the right, the output of the of the adversary and the output of the simulator will be distributed. Which also means that the query se se sequences are indistinguishable. Indistinguishable, but not identical, right? Not the same. Yes. Indistinguishable, yes. Exactly. Good. Okay. Um, and so the, the right, so the rough idea is this, which we already discussed, so I don't want to. Um, okay, so I talked about how if we build such a circuit for an encryption scheme, that would be nice. And if we build such a circuit for, for a signature scheme, that would be nice. But actually, we're going to build such a circuit for any computation. So what precisely do I mean by that? You will give me a circuit that has no leakage resilience properties at all. You'll just tell me, here's a circuit that computes something I care about. And I'll say, I'll do something to your circuit. That's a compiler. And you will get a circuit with the same input output behavior, and yet also resistance against side channel. So, OK, so what's the price you pay? Just to be clear that this isn't free. The price we're going to pay, A, the new circuit is going to be bigger by quite a bit. It's not something I would sell to Intel tomorrow if there's a big blow up. Um, and I need a component that is more special than an AND gate. Okay? I need a, a new component. So your circuit doesn't have any magical components. My circuit will need to have a certain magical component in it. And I'll explain what it is and, and why we need it. And so the blow up is polynomial. The blow up is by a factor of security parameter squared, whatever that means. So if you choose a security parameter, it will be that squared. Okay, so multiplicatively by that. Not, it would be nice if it was additive, but <laughs> it's multiplicative. So it's, it's a big, it's, no, it's not free, but. Uh. Which class of leakages you said? Good. So, so we're going to do it for two different classes of leakage. The first class, I'm going to focus on one for the talk, but, but for, for now, just sort of to state the result. The first class of leakages is um, L can see all the wires, but it cannot compute certain linear functions of those wires. Why identity is not included in this? Because, OK, I, I will make it more precise. You, you guys are rushing me to make this more <laughs> precise. But OK, so actually what, what I'm saying is that if I'm the adversary and I specify a function, whatever that function gives me plus my own polynomial time brain cannot compute the linear function of the wires. Right, so. so I'll, definition, I'll come up with a precise definition. Right, so I get to specify a function. 
and train it on the circuit, right? And I'll get back some information. And then I'll use my very powerful, well, not my very, somebody's very powerful polynomial time brain to, to then further analyze that data, right? Like you get the oscilloscope, you know, you get the graph, you analyze that. As still, in the end, you cannot compute a certain linear function. And I'll tell you what linear function. So it's a, it's a computational assumption, essentially. And it's a comp just, we used in crypto to computational assumptions. This is a computational assumption on the, on the measuring apparatus. So it's like functions with vanishing for coefficients, the time for coefficients, that's what you mean? No, I don't, no. So this is all over, actually, so I don't know enough, but this is all over finite fields, so it's, uh, and probably over GF2. And the canonical example to think of is just uh, parity. Yeah. You, can, so you cannot compute parity? You cannot compute parity. So that, that seems like that's a low degree polynomial. That's a low degree polynomial, okay. Which number two is also the same? No, no, no. Number two is a precise, no, but if you see every wire with some noise, it's almost equivalent to saying that you can only compute low degree polynomial. Mm -hmm. Because if it's high degree, it's going to get completely corrupted. You mean the noise is going to... Uh, okay, it depends on what you know, field you... Let's, let's see let's the more on, details. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. All right. So, okay, so two classes. I'm actually going to... I'm not going to talk about the second class much. The first... So let me talk about the second class now so that we can put it aside. The second class is the, the leakage L is actually a fixed function. It takes every wire and gives it to you but flips it with some probability independent of any other wire. Okay, but you can see that it's all the wires? All the wires, but there's a certain probability P. It's like binary symmetric channel. So the only solution you can offer is a wire. You can't do like computation and then noise. That's the second, right? That's this one. There's no, right, there's no computation in the noise. This thing is indep independent, identically distributed noise on every wire, but all the wires are given. Mm -hmm. so, and, uh, and of course, the P no. at this point could be independent from wire to wire, right? No, actually, we will fix P. We'll fix the lower bound on P. At least. We'll fix on the, on the lower P. Bound, P is the probability of noise. The same, exactly. It could be more. More noise is not going more to hurt. More noise is not going to hurt. Uh, but less noises. So, so independent, identically distributed noise on every wire, or so something different. That's why you need to update your M, because if you, you're with the same M, then you'll just repeat exactly. the same X and eventually you learn everything. Exactly, exactly, yes, yes. So M, so interestingly, right, so in this circuit, M, uh, this is a digital signature scheme. In this circuit, M may stay the same. By the time we transform it, it'll actually be a different state that will be changing all the time. No, 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 so uh -huh. I know you're not going to sell this to Intel yet, but Intel probably wants to build circuits which are very reliable. Uh -huh. So if you give them your circuit, they'll say, well, the first thing that we need to do in order to put it in a chip is to make sure that we repeat every wire 15 times and take majority <laughs> and votes. And that will, uh, that will kill, and that yeah. will, so, that so will make it more leaky. There's a, there's a question as to whether you can sort of combine your reliability model with their, uh, sorry, your security model with their reliability model. Excellent question. I have not thought about it at all. It's, right, because if, as soon as you had error correction, that's the whole point. Right, yeah. Right, so. Uh, we do not want leakage to correct the errors that we're throwing in there, right? Or, or, or sorry, the circuit to correct the errors that the leakage is throwing in there. Absolutely right. Yes, I have not thought about it. So just uh -huh. to understand, so you just said that uh, even if I'm starting circuit uh, is stateless, uh, the vertical circuit is going to be stateful and we have state. Well, if, even if it has a non evolved if the circuit is fully stateless, it's boring because there's nothing to protect. Leakage is not telling you anything because, right, there's really no M inside the circuit. If it's a circuit that adds to numbers. I mean, I'm thinking of, of, of them as being chosen at random and... Right, and, and fixed. So if it's chosen at random and fixed yeah. here, then it will not, it doesn't have to evolve in the original circuit, but it will have to evolve here. So in both That's cases, exactly. for both classes? For both classes. Both classes. So and is that necessary? I mean, could you have a such in which you don't evolve the... Uh, I have not thought enough about it. So I'm sure there's some... So for this leakage class, it seems pretty clear oh, because yes. M comes out, goes so back in, and you can correct eventually. Um, for this leakage class, yeah, yeah, I think so. Because, okay, at least if your leakage class includes a function that is allowed to output to just read one wire, which this class includes, then it can read off M, you know, one bit at a time eventually. Yeah. Sure. Right. So if you, if you exclude the function that probes a single wire, then, okay. then it's not obvious. But if it includes such a simple function, which probably you want to include because it seems meaningful. You know, okay, yeah. the circuit could be probabilistic and so, anyway. But that's exactly why the, right, so if okay, it's... Okay, but it's, 
okay. to, to add the probability, you have to put the state on the wire and then do something. The first thing that happens to the state is it sits in a register. It comes out on the wire as soon as the clock hits. And so you kind of have to. Um, so the nice thing, OK, so now that we've done all the negatives, I get to, to say the positives a little bit, right? The nice thing is this is for any computation. You give me, you know, you give me a favorite digital signature scheme that you proved under super quantum something assumption, it works. Well, modulo the, the leakage class thing, right? But that's kind of the, OK, and I'm going to focus on this one. I'm not going to say much more about it. OK, so even more precision, we're going to think of a circuit over a finite field like JF2, but we could be more general. Um, and, and so the original circuit has gates, well, multiplication, addition, constant, um, random gates, a coin gate that is a noisy diode type thing, um, a memory gate, which is a register. Um, and we will have, we will not have, fan out will be quite explicitly done by copy gates. There's no, you can't just fan out wires because otherwise our model doesn't. So you have to sort of put copy gates that do fan out for you. Okay. And the new circuit will will be somewhat different. Um, of course, as I said, it's going to be bigger. And it's going to operate on a different state. The state will also be transformed. So we're thinking of, you know, um, if before you had to put the actual secret key in the circuit, now you have to put something else into your circuit, some, some function of the original secret key. Um, um, and it's allowed the same gates plus one magical gate that I'm postponing the conversation about. But I will tell you about it. Okay. And of course, there's a soundness guarantee, which goes back to something I think Madhu asked. A circuit with memory M applied to X has to behave the same as the circuit prime on memory prime applied to X. Right? Um, so soundness does not change. So it's still a digital signature scheme as it was originally a digital signature. So a bit of history. There's a ton of leakage resilient crypto history, so I'm not going to tell you about all of it. Sort of what we were inspired by, two things. One is there's a general circuit transformation that was done by, by Mishaisa Hein Wagner, um, just like ours, except that in there, there wasn't a leakage class and so on. They just said, um, the leakage class is probing three wires or five wires or some fixed number of wires. That's what you got in each iteration. So they had a very similar model. But, um, and then Silvio and I had work where we had adaptively adversarially chosen leakage functions, where we said the leakage function is chosen by the adversary from a certain class, which is exactly what we're doing here. The leakage function is chosen by the adversary from a certain class. And it's adaptive as opposed to sort of just probing a few wires. But our model of computation there was not circuits. Um, we had memory that was non-leaky, which we sort of, we have something different. In this case, we have non-leaky gadget that I will talk about. So it was a different model of computation. Um, and it was not a generic transformation that we were trying to do. So sort of, we, in some sense, it's putting these two together. Um, OK, so let's think about even a trivial circuit that does absolutely nothing. No inputs, no outputs. Takes the memory out and puts it back in. It would be nice to transform that circuit, right? Uh, because if we can't do that, then we're, <laughs> then we're in trouble. Uh, OK, and suppose that our leakage class is limited to one bit identity function. So the adversary can ask about a single wire, the wire probing type attack. Well, then the adversary can learn one bit of the state. That's exactly what Amir said, right? You, you, and, and then you can, so what you really need to do um, is distribute each value over many wires. Otherwise. No interesting leakage class seems possible. And that's exactly what Ishaisa Hein Wagner did, and so that's what we do. So every wire will be encoded by, by an encoding scheme. It takes a wire, our wires are elements of this finite field, bits if you want to think of them that way, um, and it's going to encode them as T bits. And it's a randomized encoding. And the decoding all requires that it's, uh, the decoding is a surjective linear function. So XOR of bits is, what is good. But if you're over bigger fields, you can do some coefficients, some non-zero coefficients. Um, OK. And what are the allowable class of leakage functions? Now I can tell you more precisely. They're all the leakage functions that cannot decode. In other words, if, a leak, if, you, if the function sees T wires and tells you something about those T wires, using that information, you cannot decode. Um, so one way to think about it is that you know, um, the field is, is GF2 and decoding is parity, and then if you have a constant depth circuit, constant depth circuits cannot decode parity, so that's your leakage class. Um, 
okay, so a bit more precisely, this is our, this is our complexity assumption. And it's a funny complexity assumption because we know it to be false for polynomial time, but maybe it's true for your measuring method apparatus. Right? That's the complexity assumption. Now, it's not like the typical crypto complexity assumption, no polynomial time thing can factor. Blah, blah, blah. Right? So, so, okay, so we will say that this encoding scheme is L leakage indistinguishable. It's a combination, it's a property of L and encoding decoding. Right? So you choose your encoding decoding to be L leakage indistinguishable for your class L. You hope that one exists. Um, if for all x0 and x1, I encode x0, I encode x1, the adversary sees the encoding, which is t, t bits wide, or t field elements wide, and, and the probability that it correctly guessed which of the two things was encoded is, is negligible. This is your sort of classic indistinguishability definition, right? So encodings of, of one value are indistinguishable from encodings of another value. Okay? So in that sense, it's very much like, you know, the traditional reductionist cryptography. Assuming that this is true for the leakage class, for the adversarial abilities, we can then prove something. Are you, you're not happy with this? Decoding isn't on this page except there, and decoding is just supposed to be the inverse of encoding, or mm -hmm. what is it? Decoding, actually, so de decoding is, uh, think of decoding as a subjective linear function from t elements to one element. In other words, it's a, it's a dot product with a vector, right? So decoding is specified by some vector. Function. It's a linear function. We need it to be linear because otherwise our constructions don't work. We just don't know how to do it. So uh, in the simple case of GF2, the only interesting subjective linear function is parity. But, but you're not That's saying anywhere that encode, decoding of encoding of x is x. Uh, I am saying it. I'm just not. I, I, I just know you, you'll figure it out. <laughs> right? Does that? Yeah. So, so, and I'll, so dec decoding is a dot product with some vector. And, and encoding is finding a pre-image uniformly at random from all the possible pre-images. Okay, Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. okay. Um, so encoding is randomized, inherently randomized, because right, you, you, you pick a random string of the right parity. Um, so in other words, what we're saying is the leakage function cannot help you do decoding. And in particular, notice that this implies that the leakage function has to be shrinking. Because if it sees T wires and just gives you those T wires, you can do plenty of decoding in polynomial time. It's not a problem. So it has to be a fairly small leakage function. Right? We're limiting ourselves here to a class of small, fairly small amount of leakage and that, that's fairly weak computationally. And well, um, so such is life. Why is F shrinking? Because F is limited. So maybe even if you see everything, you want to but the, adversary the adversary gets the output of F and then applies polynomial time brains to the output of F. So if you just the identity function, not the, I mean the, yeah, the identity function will, will decode. So it's, it's smaller than the identity. It's weaker than the identity function in some sense. So, so, sorry? So in other words, what we're saying is, you know, if your circuit is running at some ridiculous number of gigahertz, in each iteration, you cannot get that many bits of information. It's the bound, it's, it's, you know, it's what people do in other leakage results where they say there's a limited amount of leakage at each iteration. So your circuit is running fast enough that you cannot get that many bits out. Okay, so now I can actually state the result really a lot more precisely, I think. For any linear encoding scheme that is L leakage indistinguishable, okay, so we've talked about L leakage indistinguishable, we can transform any circuit into one that can tolerate leakage from L prime, where L prime and L are related. L prime is essentially L, and I'll tell you exactly how they're related. So, so if this is L, this is a class of all functions that cannot decode, our circuit will be secure against leakage functions that are just a little bit weaker. Why? Because we lose some in the reduction. This is very typical. You lose something in the reductions. And so, so the assumption is functional can decode. The result is circuit secure against functions in L prime. And the gap is some sim very simple function. So that's what we lose in the reduction. We have to be very careful in our reductions to not lose much. Um, in fact, uh, how simple is it? It's a depth four size t squared. T is um, the width of the encoding. So if you're encoding things as, you know, one bit as T bits, that's. And uh, you're doing your copies carefully, so sort of fan out is small or, or Yeah, so we're doing. Uh, I mean, in, in this. Oh, this, no, no, this, 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 this is standard size. Fan, fan, you have unlimited fan in. Fan out. 
and, and fan out. I don't know if fan out is an issue. So I guess also, yeah, unlimited fan and unlimited fan out. Yes. These are the regular circuits, not the kinds of circuits which are Oh, it's unlimited, so it's really sort of AC zero type. AC zero type. AC zero type, absolutely. Because otherwise, in depth four, you cannot do very much with G squared right. size, right? So imagine, right, so then coming back to zero, this, this result is more general than AC zero. Sort of a lot of people say, oh, this paper is about AC zero circuits. It's not. It's about a complexity reduction. It just so happens that for once, we have some lower bounds in complexity. <laughs> we, know that, we know that AC zero circuits cannot compute parity, and then we don't need an assumption anymore, which is nice. Right? For once, you don't need an assumption. This would be true in crypto also. If we knew it could not factor in polynomial time, we wouldn't need assumptions. It's not but, any different. Uh, do you have candidate things that are uh, for conjecture for richer classes? Uh, I'm not qualified to conjecture anything like that, so I don't know. Because, because, right, the candidate things, I mean, you have to look at an oscilloscope and say, is it computing a linear function with some code? I have no idea, you know. You have to actually know a lot about the actual leakage and enough about complexity to argue those things. I don't claim to know that. Um, I view this more as a feasibility result that you can actually do reductions of this type. I don't think people have sort of done them, right? This kind of reduction where you assume some complexity of leakage and you get some result. So for Boolean circuits with AC0 leakage, you need no com complexity assumptions simply because we have a lower bound. OK, so now comes the, uh, the flies in the ointment, right? Um, we need a special gate. I warned you, right, that I would need an, a new gate in the circuit. And the special gate is not as nice as sort of an AND gate, which we know and love. Um, it's a gate that produces a random encoding of 0. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, so the result that you read it seems it's not really a fairly compute, but the fairly can be compressed or something. Yes, so it's the fairly cannot it's be compressed. More thing. Exactly. So I mean, the no is zero circuit that I like, give and then no string of fairly is zero can produce any other shortest string of from which the fairly can be recovered. Which actually follows from Hostel's result. So but isn't it like uh, now uh, something uh, complicated? It's a different result. It's, it, it's yeah. a different result that just cannot be computed. Stronger. And at some point, I looked into it and we figured out that it, that it matches what we need, and yeah. I forgot it's exactly it's what it is. Hardness of compression. It's hardness of yeah. compression. You're absolutely right. It, it is. It is. It is because you're compressing and then giving it to a polynomial time machine. You need compression lower bound. Right. Yeah, I think so. I think the, the, yeah, the Harnik now is. Uh, okay. They extend this. Uh, right. Very lower bound. In fact, I think that's. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the two models were. Uh, you could work in model one and model two, and we're analyzing model one. Right, so this is model one. Both uh, said that the two models are equal. But the uh, point is, do you still need such a uh, secure gate in Model 2? Yes. In fact, the, the only way we know how to do Model 2 is in a more complicated, with a more complicated gate for, for at least interesting levels of probability. I'm not, I don't think the two models are equivalent. I right think now. it's morally similar, but not. Uh, I think morally similar is accurate because neither one can compute. If you have, if you have a T sharing and you have, you have enough noise that at least one bit is likely flipped, then you will never be able to compute parity. Um, but it, I, yeah, we didn't. We don't see an equivalence. Um, okay. So so the gate. What's the gate? The gate needs to atomically sort of poof produce an encoding of zero. In other words, produce a string of parity zero. If you want to think of. of it's a long string. And it's a string of length t, whereas all the other gates operate on bits. You know, one bit plus one bit equals, you know, and or nothing, nothing magical at all. This is, this is fairly magical. So, okay, so how do I justify this? Um, I justify this by saying, very importantly, it's computation independent and simple. And in other words, it's a reduction. So, uh, in Silvio's and my paper, we're arguing that you should be able to reduce complex computations that are shielded to simple computations that are shielded. And this is very much in that spirit. We're saying that if you want to have a shielded signature scheme, 
and then you invent a new signature scheme and you have to shield that one, that's tricky. But maybe if somebody produces a shielded gate that magically does encodings of zero, you know, then that's all you need and that's a standard component and you can manufacture it en masse and, and sell it to everybody cheaply and then you can sort of do it, right? So that's the justification that you can have a single component. It's computation dependent, it has no inputs by the way, right? It's just, it just has outputs, so it's harder to attack. It simply outputs when you ask it to output. Um, and uh, importantly, it contains a random number generator it, inside it. It contains a random number generator, which is tricky. And yes, that's not pleasant. I agree. Um, it contains a hash function, which is tricky. Maybe right, or maybe it contains a bunch of noisy diodes or something. I don't know what it contains, right? I'm saying. Ah, oh, right, right, but no, but <laughs> yes, uh, but it, no, it actually has to output, right, because ultimately we need a distinguishability, so there'll be, yeah, okay, good. So you can't really, yeah, you, uh, I think, I think the first implementation of Netscape did that. Uh, so, um, okay, and importantly, I'm not claiming any ob that, that sort of nothing about the gate is observable. What it outputs is now T wires, an encoding of zero, and that encoding is observable like every other wire. Those wires are not special. It's just that how you get those T things are not observable. If I can justify it a little bit more is that notice that this can be computed with a, with a simple depth two circuit. Just do sort of a circular, come up with, with T minus one random bits and, and yeah. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But so, so it's a fairly simple circuit where what we're trying to shield is maybe some complicated digital signature modular exponentiation, blah, blah, blah circuit. Another way to think about this um, and that's uh, Goldwasser, Kalai, Rothblum way of thinking about this. Um, they have a paper called One Time Programs, which actually does something relatively similar, it transforms circuits into ones that don't leak anything. In fact, stronger than don't leak, cannot be executed twice even. Um, and the way they think about these types of components is that there's something pre-wired. And every time you want to execute the circuit, you use the pre you use it up. It's like a tape, you know, like a tape roll. And you, you tear off a piece, and then you tear off a piece, and then you tear off a piece. And eventually you're not. So your circuit it has limited use. So you can think of this randomness as being produced by something. You can think of it as being hardwired and released when you need to. And then you throw it out at the end. The circuit is no longer useful. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to um, uh, our uh, long time ago, mm -hmm. idea, what was it? That you had the one special gate, which our, again is computationally independent in some sense. Right. You want to do a one way notation. Right. And we have these permutations that we call durable, and from that we build see random generators. Right, but the mm -hmm. random generator. So, how about if you start with a random X originally, mm -hmm. you compute f of X, you leak whatever you have to leak, but the point is that you compute Y, you cannot reconstruct X, right? Mm -hmm. But what what you do is that you actually then compute the, the really um, uh, a random vector fixed constant and publicly known dot product with x and, um, uh, and you do so until you get zero okay? okay if you get zero otherwise you go to uh, compute the next y the next y until uh, y dot product x is whatever and, and, and if you compute zero then that's the encoding you're looking Ah, I see. Uh, and that's it. And, uh, and then I don't see why if this is a, a durable function, whether just uh, using so our own thi old things, and, 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 and then you just say, you take, you know, now the dot product you do with this ordinary gates. Okay, so... So rather than saying that you have an, an encoding that poofs and gives something at random, you don't know what it is, you say, okay, I'll give you, give me a circuitry that you can compute Dot product. One way function. The dot product is, is in your model. The only thing protected is uh, that whatever leakage is for this function is not enough to invert it. I see. So it's not, it's not obvious to me that it will be enough because our simulation uses very heavily that this, you actually, that the adversary cannot tell whether the thing is really zero or not. So we, the, we know it produces an encoding of zero, but I could fake it and give you an encoding of one and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. That can even be better for simulation purposes. But if you never have to put that one, uh -huh. you just feed it to yourself. and you keep, That's what you keep on doing on a clock. 
Uh, and then any time that you want to do a mm -hmm. zero, you just uh, take the dot product of uh, by other means of a circuit. Let, let, me, let me take it offline because I want to think about it. But I, I think, yeah, this is an interesting thing to think about. There's another thing. You, in mm -hmm. principle, you could just, uh, just uh, for example, uh, so, so maybe you can explain what's conceptually different, maybe the simplicity of the circuit. I mean, you could have like a special atomic gate let's say, is the decryption operation of a homomorphic encryption scheme. Mm -hmm. And then you can run the whole circuit homomorphically and then just feed it to this, this special gate and it will leave you at output and then... Yeah, but you're, you're, what you're proposing, your special gate has a secret, a secret in it. Yes. But here his gate... And has an input to it. Has no state. A state, okay. I mean, no but secret it, uh, state. Whatever it's deterministic. That's true. That's true. So, and it protects against all yeah. kinds of things. Also, what I was saying is that if you initialize the uh, circuit. So, maybe, uh, so by now, you have follow-up work that actually removes this, right? Or am I? Uh, I, I, I heard rumors, that's all oh, I know. Okay. <laughs> Nobody told me about it. I, okay. So I don't actually. There, there's, I think there have been, right, so I don't claim that this gate is necessary. We had some intuition that this was absolutely necessary to have some big atomic gate, and, and now there seems to be a result that says it's not, but that's all I know, so I don't know. I don't know any more than that. If you, if you can tell me more, then I'd love to know. This is like a future. This is a, right, so. No, 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 just, uh, so I think Guy, Rathblum, and Chaffee, they talked about it in some ROM session, I don't remember where. Oh, so I did, okay. I should find they out. They talked about it in some, I gave a two minute version that, uh, they can remove the... The big atomic gate. The atomic gate. Nice, okay. I think, I, you know, I heard a two minute version, but uh, I think... So maybe I'll bug Guy and Shafi. Unless there's that I missed, but uh, I think okay. they missed. Good, okay. So I won't get too many details given that it's five o'clock. I'll give you a very high level of what's going on and we'll stop right now. I won't give all the painful details. The transformation is actually sort of what you expect it to be. Every so we had the original circuit. It looked more or less like this. What we're doing is we're replacing each internal wire by a bundle of T wires. T is equal to 3 in this thing because I couldn't draw anymore, right? But there's some bundle of T wires. And then inputs get encoded before they get in and, and outputs get decoded. So that's our compiler. You take the original circuit, you preserve the high level structure, but you expand every wire. Of course, you have to do something to every gate. This idea is the same as in Scheisse, High and Wagner, um, but, but what we do is different. So, so what do we do to every gate? I'll show you the addition gate, and I think I'll stop there because the addition gate is fairly simple. Okay, here's something you do not want to do, and it's fairly obvious, but I just want to state it so that we're on the same page. If you have an encoding of A, you have an encoding of B, you don't want to decode it, add it, and then re-encode. Because if this leaks, well, that's it, right? You can't simulate anything. So, right, so this is easy to attack. What you want to do is maybe use linearity of the encoding scheme, which is exactly what we do. So then, you know, you will just add wire by wire and by linearity plus will work out. And this is nice, except we don't know how to simulate it. So this is all good. The adversary is good. But we, we can't prove that this goes on well for many gates. And the intuition for why we can't prove it, right, we want to build a simulator. I'm just reminding you, this is the security definition. We need a simulator. How do we design the simulator? Well, the simulator... Right, is interacting with the adversary. The adversary says, here's x, here's f. The only way we know how to design simulators is in this black box way. Well, not the only way, but, but most of the ways. And we're going to, therefore, have to fake f of the wires. But how do you fake f of the wires when you don't know what the state is? The wires contain information about the state. And you cannot fake it. So how do you design the simulator that produces f of the wires? Um, you, right, the function f, even though it's fairly simple, it can verify arbitrary gates. f can verify that an AND is computed correctly. It's a very simple thing to do. You don't need to be able to decode, you know, elementary gates, right? You can. So if f can verify, then all the wires have to be consistent with x and y because you don't know what f is. It's some function. You cannot verify the whole circuit, but it could randomly pick a gate and verify it, and the adversary could notice that you're incorrect. So you cannot fake anything. As a simulator, you cannot fake anything. You have to be honest in all the wires because f applied to wires will sort of tell the adversary is it right or wrong at some particular <laughs> gate. It's sort of like, you know, the, the, the verifier is verifying something you don't know where. You have to be correct. You know, this is not the PCP where, right? It's, you have to be correct in every step because right? the verifier is cheating. Using f like it's a black box, kind of right. So the only simulation technique that I know of, kind of, right? The, the simple simulation technique. So as the simulator doesn't know the state, you cannot do this. So what do we do? This is why we introduced this non-verifiable <coughs> atomic gate. So that we do not have to simulate the whole circuit, honestly, because we don't know how. This atomic gate is bigger than what F can verify. 
F cannot actually tell if the encoding and encoding are 0 or not. So this is our opaque gate that outputs the encoding of 0. The simulator can fake the output and, and won't get caught. So now the full transformation for the plus gate is you take your two inputs, you add them bit by bit, so that's OK. And then at the end, you throw in an opaque gate, and then you have this. And now, sort of, if, if the two inputs are given and this is given, the simulator can just fake this and make it work out so, without knowing the state end. I will not show you. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to show the multiplication gate. It's messy. It's big. That's where the t squared blows up comes, comes in, because well, there's t inputs here, t inputs here. The first thing you have to do is build a matrix. And then you do a bunch of other stuff that I will skip. You use the opaque gate a lot. Um, you use t squared gates. T of them are this magical gate. So it's not great, but, but it is what it is. And that's why the circuit blow up is t squared. So that's the polynomial size blow up. OK. So I think I've said all of these things. Right? We can transform any circuit. It would be nice to get rid of this opaque gate that it doesn't leak. And apparently there's claims that you can. I want to understand what Sylvia is saying about getting rid of it. Um, the proofs are actually very tricky. Well, not very tricky, but they're not your traditional reductions because there's these two components, f and the adversary. And you cannot, remember, we want to lose very little in the reduction of f. We had this tiny little sliver that we were losing, a thing of depth 4 and t squared. So you can't do like a polynomial time reduction. You have to do reductions of size t squared and, and depth 4 in order for this to work out. Um, and so we have a very small reduction loss. And so that's why the proofs get, get very messy. But um, I think that's it. Any questions? So it seems to me that, I mean, you're already, the circuits are actually carrying encodings of information everywhere, it sounds mm -hmm. like, right? Uh, but they're randomized encodings. They're randomized encodings and not necessarily are correcting encodings. Mm -hmm. the in fact, so they're, the they're very error-prone encodings because you flip, they're XOR encodings. You flip a single bit, they're, they're terrible for error correction, actually. They're exactly the opposite of error correction yeah, encodings. Uh, I see. Right. But my sense is that, I mean, maybe that's conceivable that one could sort of go reliability in the other direction and, uh, and this. security chair, and that? do both uh, uh -huh. simultaneously. I mean, it's not, given that you're mostly relying on sort of linear encodings, Maybe, I, I see. Yeah, yeah good. That, that's, a, that's a good point. I've not thought about it at all. In any case, these homomorphic encryption things could reduce the, the, the whole question always to protecting this one type of circuit. Right. right. So actually, I should say that there's a work by, uh, by Juma and Wallis, I think. Is that the right authorship? That uses homomorphic encryption and the sort of independent leakage assumption that some things leak only here and some things leak only here to do a very similar general transformation mm -hmm. to what we do. So, so people have thought about this already in some form. Yeah. 